Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our special webinar with uh, Barry Deutsch. Uh, Barry is a well-known thought leader in hiring and performance management with more than 20 years of experience in the executive search field and hiring and process improvement. He and his partners have conducted workshops on hiring, interviewing, and performance management to more than 20,000 people in the last 10 years. He has published numerous online and magazine articles about hiring and leveraging top performers. And he's the author of one of my favorite books, You're Not the Person I Hired. Please welcome Barry Deutsch. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay, so um, over the last two to three weeks, you know, I, I've probably done over 20 years, as you know, Mark was alluding to, 1,200 presentations for Vistage groups around the world um, on hiring, retention, employee engagement, performance management. And over the last two to three weeks, many of my clients have been overwhelmed with this idea of how, how do we manage folks that are out of sight, out of mind? How, how do we make sure we're doing it right? What are the things we should be thinking about? And so I put together a little hour and a half, hour and a half program and, and suddenly it's become very popular. I've probably done just in the last two weeks, probably 25 of these. And, and what I'm finding is I'm, I'm learning at the same time about what some of the key issues are and problems. And so like Mark said, I'm not gonna wait till the very end to take questions. As we go through this, I'll stop a few times. I'll ask what some of you are doing, how you're approaching it, what you're putting in place. My experience of doing workshops, webinars, whatever we wanna call them, is that sometimes we tend to learn as much from each other as me sitting here spewing out content and goodness knows, I could probably do this for eight hours at a time. So, so I'm gonna try to be intentional about taking little breaks, stepping back, asking questions, trying to build a little bit of engagement and at the same time role model for how some of your managers should be leading online meetings. Okay, so uh, the, the first issue really is everything we know about how we manage people, how we organize that, where we're all sitting in the office, they're just down the hall, they're in the room next to us, is radically different. And I'm finding that many organizations are just all of a sudden we're remote, we're expecting things to work exactly the same and nothing could be further from the truth. And so we wanna think about, you know, what are the things that we have to be more intentional about, more focused around? What are the few key points that will help us get more out of people, get higher motivation, get people to lean in and start producing versus everybody being succumbing to just fear and, and paranoia and being hamstrung to get anything done. One of the big questions that comes up is, you know, am I really getting a full amount of work from folks? Am I getting 10% from them? Am I getting 2%? Um, and there are a number of things that we can do to boost folks' motivation, intensity, effort, how they're working, how we're staying on top of it as we uh, cycle through this process. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, take you through an agenda of some of the key points to think about. Eight key things that if we can start working on a few of these, we can start to make a dramatic difference in the way we're managing and leading people um, remotely. And when I finish this, I'll throw out to the whole group, is there anyone who has any thoughts or ideas of anything that I haven't covered? All right, number one, do we have the right infrastructure in place? Do we have a VPN set up? Are we securing our networks? Are we communicating how to do that with folks logging in remotely? Do we have the right collaboration tools in place? How are we encouraging pro, you know, project management, setting deadlines, staying on top of what's getting done without measuring things like how long were you in front of your computer? So we'll talk, I'm not an IT expert, but we'll talk about a few of the key best practices around infrastructure. Number two, are we letting people know what's expected of them? This is the number one problem of performance management is that most people don't know what does my immediate supervisor or boss expect from me? That's a bad problem when we're all together, but when we're apart from each other, it becomes amplified right through the ceiling. And so one of the most important things I'm gonna talk about today is how do we begin to set expectation outcomes, deliverables, the KPIs, and communicate that to folks. And literally every major business author in the last decade and a half has talked about this as being a primary issue around getting great success from the organization. So I'll talk about some of those reference points also. Number three, you're asking many of your managers, senior staff to run meetings online. Do people actually understand how to run an online meeting, how to set a good agenda, how to encourage participation, 
how to make sure that the extroverts aren't running rampant over the introverts, how to make sure everybody feels engaged in, in the session, how to do a little bit of upfront, you know, caring and empathy with the group before you start the meeting. Sitting around the table where we're all together in the office is a little different experience from running Zoom meetings, whether they're internal, cross-disciplinary, or with uh, uh, customers. So we'll just, we'll touch on that. One of the most important elements of employee satisfaction and happiness, if it's not the most important element, it's probably in the top three, is the direct relationship an employee has with their immediate manager. Do all the people in our organization who are leading teams and overseeing folks understand how to conduct a good one-to-one, -one, how to do effective coaching, how to listen deeply, how to build trust? And this kind of leads us to the next piece of our agenda, which is, are we working very hard at engaging our workforce, especially when they're out of sight, out of mind? Are we working on a structured recognition program? Are we teaching people how to show caring and empathy that's not natural to them? Are we working on how we stimulate folks and help them to understand how they matter to the organization? And are we also working on using this time period to improve our effectiveness of helping people fill in the gaps in skill and knowledge, learning, development, personal development, and are our teams becoming more effective in how they work together? So we'll touch on those elements of employee uh, engagement. Communication. Many of my uh, clients have said to us, and said to me, how do I communicate? What's the difference between them not being in the office? How structured should it be? How often should we be having morning stand-up meetings, coffee breaks, end-of-the-day check-ins, uh, broadcasts from the CEO or president to the whole organization, team meetings, one-to-ones? How much fun should we build into this in terms of doing you know, happy hours, pizza parties, birthday celebrations? So we'll talk a little about the communication that's important when we're all work or most of us are working remotely. Second to last, do we have a strategy? Do we have a plan? Can we articulate that to our entire workforce? What are we gonna do? When are we gonna do it? What's your role? What kind of impact will you make? How do we all pull together? What's the 30, 60, 90 day plan, six month plan? Are we articulating that? I'm finding many Vistage members have been a little bit paralyzed by what's going on and have had trouble communicating what this plan looks like to their workforce. The result is many people in your organization are making it up. The rumors are running rampant. And what happens when there's an unknown, people tend to invent the worst case scenarios. So I think it's, they're looking to you as the leader of your organizations to communicate what's that plan, what's that strategy, how are we going to emerge from this process even stronger, which leads us to our last agenda item is, are there things that we can be working on over the next three to six months that just because we've been in this rising tide of economic expansion over the last six to eight years, we've shoved a lot of stuff to the back burner. Is now a great time to start working on things like process improvement, customer engagement, uh, operational improvements, how we work together as teams, two or three key projects that will help us to emerge from this in six months, even stronger and more capable than we are today versus picking up where we just left off and maybe even with a competitive advantage to move forward from there. Eight key things that I'm gonna to touch on. Most folks have told me that's a fairly, fairly comprehensive list. If we can get through this in an hour, we'll be uh, uh, doing quite well. But now I'd like to kind of throw it out to the group and ask, is there anything that I didn't mention or articulate in that agenda that you wanna make sure that we get at as we spend the next hour or so with each other? So please type that into the chat. You can lower your uh, uh, mouse to the bottom of your screen and you should see a toolbar pop up and chat is one of your options there. Chat something in there so we know that it's working. If you're a Vistage member, chat who your chair is. I'm going to let Mark stop me if he sees something in the chat because I can't, and I'm, I'm in the middle of talking, I can't necessarily see that. I sometimes see the chat box flash, but Mark, I'll let you uh, stop me if somebody posts something and wants to answer a question or have a thought. Okay, we got a couple that popped up, Barry. Dealing with employees who seem unengaged and are texting during Zoom meetings. Or you see their eyes go off somewhere else, or you could tell they're really working on, 
you know, playing that game on their computer while you're trying to run the Zoom meeting. Um, I, I think it's important to set some ground rules to, to create a sense of um, uh, what are the, the group norms of how we're going to operate together. You know, you go to, I don't know, Mark, if you do this in your Vistage meetings where you put up on the wall, here's the group norms for how we're going to operate during our meeting. Some chairs do that. I, I don't always do that, but um, we communicate our group norms often, and I think that's a good suggestion to do it for virtual meetings because they could be different. Absolutely. They should be written. You should share it with everyone. You should have a dialogue around it. Um, and, and then call people out that aren't aligning around that value or their group norms. I mean, one, I coach high school girls basketball, 13 and 14 year old girls. I've been doing it for a decade. And one of the very first things we start on in our first meeting together in the summer, and then we continually reinforce is what's our group norms of working together, you know, like showing up, you know, so it's important that all the girls understand they should show up 15 minutes early, have their shoes tied, ankle guards on, ready to go when we start the practice. You know, that they're focused, they're not chatting, they're not picking at each other, you know, playing games when, when I'm coaching and giving instruction. We have a, you know, a simple set of six to 10 core group norms, and we're always reinforcing it. And our teams are successful, I think, uh, to a big part of aligning around those group norms. Same thing in running a virtual meeting. Anybody else have a thought or comment they'd like to put out that, that I didn't touch on? Well, one person wrote, my concern is going to be, how am I going to get people to return to the office once this is over with? I think people are starting to like being in their sweatpants and not having to leave their home or do the commutes. You know, it's interesting in that I just did a, a workshop a little earlier today, and that was exactly one of the issues that came up is folks are going to get really used to working from home and doing virtual meetings. They're going to like being in their pajamas and doing work. How, how do I encourage them to come back? Now might be the time to start thinking about what does a remote work policy look like? One of the things that drives employee engagement and motivation and happiness is the opportunity to maybe work remotely a little bit. Not all jobs have that ability. Like you can't take your receptionist and put them, put them at home, or you can't take a factory worker and let them work from home. But for the jobs where they can work from home, should you have, should you right now be starting to develop a policy for what that looks like? what's appropriate, how you're going to manage it, um, and what roles might be eligible for that. And there's a lot of really good stuff in the Vistage library, in the human resources, I forgot what they call it, Mark, group, network, uh, you know, chat room, you know, whatever Vistage calls that thing, where people are raising these kinds of questions. Uh, it might be interesting to explore that with some of your fellow members across the country. Okay, that's okay. it for now. Let's, uh, let's move on here. I'm gonna close the chat box. Infrastructure. So we, there's a few basic things that we probably wanna put in place to be able to do this over the next three to six months. I think that one of the greatest outcomes of working remotely right now is going to be able to build a better methodology for collaboration among the team. Some of you may have already been using some of these tools. Please, you know, if I, if I mention one or you've got an experience of using something, I'd love you to share it with the group of how you got it in place, what's effective, what's not effective, and, and let's spend a few minutes chatting around this. First, is every expert I talk to in the IT field says, you should not be allowing people to connect to your network uh, just through their Wi-Fi systems. You should force them to go through a VPN to secure your a virtual private network, to secure your data, to make sure that people aren't being able to hack into your system. Some of you may have already gotten to this, Mark, I don't know if any of your members are IT managed services experts. You may want, you know, if not, I'm sure in the New York area, there's tons of Vistage members that do this kind of work. Um, you, you might want to have someone come in and do an audit to make sure you are secure now that everybody is working remotely and logging in. Are you giving your employees a fact sheet or guidance of how to secure their own home networks? You know, are they using double authentication? Are they um, are they uh, using appropriate passwords to make sure that they can't get hacked or people can't get into your networks from these kind of connections? One of the big things that suddenly evaporates because people are starting to work from home is where, where I think 90% of the dialogue occurs in most companies. It's in the hallway, it's over the cubicle wall, it's in the break room, over the coffee pot, it's by the water cooler. A lot gets done through informal conversation. 
And are there some tools that we can use to foster that informal, casual group dialogue that's outside of when we're all doing a Zoom meeting for a particular project? The two most popular tools, one is called Yammer, which is a, an element of Microsoft Teams. And then the other is Slack, which if you're not running Teams, Slack seems to be the most common tool that other folks are using. There's a few others out on the marketplace, but these teams seem to be the primary ones. I'm curious if anybody on the call has any significant experience of either they're right in the middle of implementing these or they've been using them for a little while. I'd love to hear from you about how it's changed or improved how employees communicate or interact with each other. Who'd like you to go can, first? You can raise your hand, you can check yes. Who here is using either Yammer or Slack? Or you could raise your hand this way. All right, Jay, why don't you uh, talk to the group? Sure. So we uh, implemented Slack about six months ago. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we started using it as uh, somewhat of a workflow tool. We're able to pass work uh, across Asia to Europe, um, back to the States, so people understood their handoffs. As we started, you know, and kick off different processes that we need to get done, um, but it became a community kind of like, I don't know if it's exactly like Facebook, where people are able to chat back and forth and not on email. And it was just much easier um, for the staff in the different regions and even the different groups to be able to chat with each other. So, you know, we, we're, we're, we're implemented. It's live um, with about half our staff. But, you know, we've been really happy with it. And, you know, I wish I, wish I could say oh, we were smart and, uh, you know, we did it for this unbelievable scenario we're in. Um, but it's working really well, uh, you know, with all our staff across the globe working from home now. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing the, what we're able to post and, and run it like a community and, and able to keep in touch with everybody outside of email. Jay, Jay summarized it well, is that it creates a sense of community. And many of my clients, particularly ones who are in the professional services arena, are actually using it to improve the way they communicate with their clients by using shared rooms with their clients and, and clients who would normally not pick up the phone and call, not, not want to send an email, now are, now are raising their level of communication with you. And so this is a great step through the recessionary time period that if people aren't buying or purchasing product from you or they put things on hold projects, is to improve your communication with those clients so that when you emerge from this, it's even stronger than it was before. The other thing that a lot of my clients are using is they're actually setting up uh, uh, like chat rooms where they can have casual conversations around fun events. Like if we're not doing it as a Zoom meeting, maybe it's a tell a joke day, bring, you know, send a post a picture of your pet. There's all sorts of ways to build a strong sense of community among the team, whether it's fun, it's casual, it's actually part of the formal uh, uh, project things that you're working on and with customers. Anybody else? Experience? Stu? Okay, can you hear me? I was gonna say that we've also been using it for a year and a half and we started to use it for one reason only, which is to cut down in the emails we had with employees. So we kind of set up a rule and this came from a networking suggestion to as a way to cut down on emails, that any inter-office communication should be on Slack. So that, you know, because what we found is each people were emailing each other internally, that was just building up. So that we, we found that to be very effective way to, to keep some of our internal emails down. Thanks, Stu. And, and even some of my smaller Vistage clients are using these tools, you know, where they've got 10 or 15 people, not 200, they're still finding it to be a great resource uh, or platform for communicating, sharing, and building a sense of community. Yeah. Two items. We use Mattermost. We've been doing it for more than a year. Um, and it's because we, we have three shifts of, of technicians. And in order to be sure that everybody knows what's going on, it's a, a, on, a running dialogue of, of conversations. And um, it's easy to in, include somebody new. Uh, and uh, it's been quite effective. Uh, we get 
notices on our um, mobile phones that a, a message has come in. And um, you can look back in the conversation to see what else has transpired to get to that point. And there's also an ability to attach uh, reference documents. Anyway, so it's been very effective. Thank you, Pat. Great, I'm not familiar with that one, but I'm glad you mentioned that. Okay, so having some tool like this is important. The other thing is, are we teaching our teams how to run effective online meetings? There's a, there's a couple of key things to think about, like I mentioned before. Are we getting people to lean in to do video? The number one best practice out of having remote folk workers is everybody should be doing it on video. And many Vistage uh, members are telling me they've got a lot of employees who are reticent to want to do it through video. They don't want to connect their video camera. They're not comfortable with the space they have at home. They don't like the way they look on video. They're fearful of it. I, I would probably urge you to, to try to really push people to do all of their calls versus audio calls, telephone calls, to try to do them through video, just because we're separated and isolated from each other. That's the number one best practice I'm seeing. The other piece is, how do they run the meeting? Are they doing a good job of setting the agenda? Are they soliciting feedback from everyone? Are they making sure that everybody's engaged? The in extroverts aren't running rampant over the introverts couple of key points. I actually developed a little checklist. I will send this out to Mark. Many, you know, Vista Cheers asked me to put this together. It's six key points. I'll send it to Mark and he can distribute it to all of you. Your employees are looking for advice, coaching, help, to-dos, fact sheets of how to do some of these things where we're just assuming, hey, just carry on business as normal. Even if you're not using tools like um, Yammer or uh, Mattermost or uh, uh, Slack, I still think it's very important to have some centralized location where people can multiple, you know, simultaneously work on documents like Google Docs. They can, there's an intranet where they can reference a lot of this data. We're not worried about, oh, is it revision B at 530 that was done in the morning, that we have some centralized place to make it smooth and easy and simplistic for employees to share information and work together. The last piece around this is you've got lots of projects. How are you managing those projects? The to-dos, the milestones, the deliverable dates. Are we using some kind of tool like Basecamp? Are we using one of the Microsoft 365 tools? Are we rolling and cascading that up to see what those dashboards look like? Where are we missing targets, not getting things done? Where is things falling through the cracks? Is anybody using a tool like Basecamp or any other to, to manage projects? particularly in this remote environment. Yeah, Jay, what, what you said you, I, was it you who said before you were using Basecamp? You have to unmute. Oh, it's Fiona here. Um, we um, moved over to Teams about a year ago, Microsoft uh -huh. Teams. Um, and we use it for the chat activity that you were talking about before. We use it for all of our virtual um, video meetings, though it's not as good as Zoom because you don't get as you only get four images at a time. Um, <clears throat> and we also use it for centralized document management. Um, I, I can't say that I, um, I stand here as a Teams advocate, um, but every experience we've had with integrating all the different ways of communicating has made it really um, a, a whole new way of doing business. I can't imagine how we would have moved into this virtual world if we didn't have teams up. Um, and uh, being able to attach a document from your centralized repository um, to a chat, being able to pull them up and share them during meetings and everyone's got um, equal access to them um, has all been absolutely incredible. However, we have found that from a project management point of view, that we have, um, have started moving outside of Teams to Airtable. And Airtable, I would say today, is now more frequently used by us than Excel. And, that, and I'm an Excel junkie. Um, and for everything from um, our project management to our product development to um, anything and everything now, we're using Airtable, which being hosted on the cloud makes it super easy for anyone and everyone to get in and is a really excellent sharing platform. That's great. Yeah. Air table, A-I-R table. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. 
literally we have transferred almost everything we did onto Airtable and it's a co collaborative tool with a whole level, series of different permissions you can put in place. Um, it's got to be the easiest tool I've ever used and even my um, <clears throat> uh, anachronistic tech uncomfortable team members um, are finding it very simple. The right. other big one in this space is called Trello. Um, right, so, so all I'm suggesting is all of these tools allow you to work better, more effectively, more efficiently. There's a variety that are coming out about performance management, uh, employee recognition. There's a great wealth of outstanding tools. The one complaint I've heard from Vistage members over the last couple of weeks is they're very concerned about rolling this stuff out and overwhelming their entire workforce. It's like suddenly we're putting in a project management software, a collaboration tool, a recognition system, and, and a lot of their employees are revolting over the, the pace that we're trying to use these tools if you haven't already had them in place. And so just a cautionary note that, that a big part of using these is not just implementing the software. There's an enormous change management piece that goes with working a little bit differently. Um, and to think about that pace of change you're forcing upon the organization. Okay, next subject. Um, most studies show that a significant portion of your workforce does not understand what's expected of them. Studies show that it's roughly around 50%. I actually think it's up around 70 to 75%. This is the number one problem in employee engagement, satisfaction, and retention. Hiring causes, it, it's the number one reason hiring fails, and performance management suffers. Not defining what's expected of people. This has nothing to do with the traditional job description. This is about quantifiable, outcome-based metrics, KPIs, deliverables. We can pretty much recognize what the issue is around hiring, but let me take the employee engagement, recognition, motivational side of it. Is anybody on the call familiar with the work that Gallup has done in this area around employee engagement? They got crystallized in a book about 12 to 15 years ago called First Break All the Rules. Anybody familiar with this? Okay, at, at the end of our workshop, I'm going to send you a copy of our book if you don't already have it or I'll put, give it to Mark and he can distribute it. Two of the chapters in that book, 30 to 40 pages, goes into incredibly granular detail on how to define success for people, whether they're managers or forklift drivers. But the flip side of that, right behind that virtual book on your bookshelf, obviously I'm biased, right? It's right there in the front. Um, right behind that is this other book. And I'm going to recommend you download it the second we're done today. The title of the book is First Break All the Rules. It's my Bible of employee engagement. Two of the senior executives of the Gallup Coin organization, 15, 12, 15 years ago, looked at 20 million interviews that Gallup had done over 20 years. They were trying to get at what's an engaged employee. And the reason that was so important is what they discovered is engaged employees lean in, are proactive, show initiative, go above and beyond the call of duty, do more than is expected of them. They take a sense of responsibility, accountability, and ownership. They're what many would call your Pareto employees, where you get 80% of your results from 20% of your people. That's the power of an engaged employee. Gallup also, also identified two other classes of employees. This first class called the engaged employee, they update their research every year, and right before we went into this crisis, was at about 30%. The surveys they had done showed that 30% of your workforce was highly engaged. The next category is what they call the disengaged. This is the group of folks who just don't care they work for your company. They're trying to get by doing the absolute minimum necessary so you won't fire them, you'll tolerate them, but they don't care, they're, they're just showing up, um, absenteeism may be a problem, uh, their productivity is fairly low compared to their peers. You're just a paycheck. And the final group that Gallup identified is what they called the actively disengaged. This is about 20% of your workforce. This is the group that's dragging everyone else into the cesspool with them. They're dysfunctional. They're toxic. They create drama. 
This is the group that Jack Welch got in legal trouble over at GE for lopping off, you know, over a decade at the bottom of force rankings. It's very easy to move folks from the disengaged group into the engaged group. The problem is very few companies focus on some of the most simplest basic things to allow them to do that. I'm going to touch on a number of these through our conversation. Gallup identified 12 key things that have to be present for an engaged employee. Mark, it, from your recall of this material, do you remember what was in the number one slot on their list of 12 things? Well, I remember some of the 12, but um, I don't know if having a best friend at work or that employees have the tools that they need to succeed or what was the, the top one, but I think that those are, were two of them. That those were two of them. The top one was, do I understand what my immediate boss expects of me? That was the number one thing in employee excitement, passion, energy, engagement, motivation. Do I understand what's expected of me? Now, I, Mark, you gonna say something? Yeah, what's interesting for me, Barry, is I run a key group and I've also, as a visiting speaker, asked key groups what their number one challenge is with their CEOs. And it is consistently, I don't know what's expected of me. It's constantly changing. I hear that from many folks that I talk to in my executive search practice. And in fact, uh, a number of years after we wrote our first book, you're not the person I hired, which I'm going to send to you all. We wrote a second book called This Is Not the Job I Accepted. Because many candidates take a job and they think it's one thing. And then after they get aboard, they realize they're being expected to do something entirely different. This is at the very heart of management. Defining what's the expectation. Now, for 20 years, I've been preaching, pitching, talking about doing this at an individualistic level. I'm finding many of my Vistage clients are starting to put a system in place to actually manage these expectations. And the most popular one today is called EOS. Are any of your members on the call, Mark, moving along the path of putting EOS in place? I see Fiona raised her hand. It looks like a few people have, and our speaker actually next week is going to be talking about uh, EOS. So. So that's the, that's the enterprise or system-wide level by which we take everybody's individual, quote, rocks, and we roll them all up or cascade them up so that we can achieve flawless execution. You know, that everybody on a team, theirs roll up to the team level, all the teams roll up to the corporate level, and we begin to get done the stuff that we want to achieve. Now, what's interesting, in a rising tide, like the economic expansion we've had over the last six to eight years, if you don't do this, doesn't really matter because in a rising tide, it, it overcomes all the mistakes, errors, process problems we have as an organization. Boom, now we're in a recession. We're gonna see 30 million people unemployed. It's gonna take two years to climb out of this to any degree once we stop the economy. All of a sudden, all the issues of how we relate to customers, how we do things internally, how we work together become a glaring issue and problem and they start to surface. And many of my clients that have put EOS or are working along that path are finding it helps them to be more effective as an organization. What's the downside from doing it? I'm sure Fiona will, will chime in here. It's that it is unbelievably painful. It takes an inordinate amount of time and effort to really think about what do we want to achieve? How are we measuring it? What does success look like? And how do we evolve it and make it dynamic given what's going on around us? Fiona, any, any thought or comment about implementing this kind of performance management? Uh, sure, we've been uh, on EOS now for coming up on 60 years. Um, and I, I think that to minimize um, the pain that you refer to, <clears throat> uh, you have to have a strong internal advocate who is prepared to drive the process. And I took that role on for myself, including making sure that everybody was uh, trained. Um, I. I don't let anyone deviate from it. And it is so ingrained now in us culturally that, um, it, you know, I, I don't think there would ever be any going back. When each new hire comes on board, part of their um, interview process is describing the expectations of accountability um, associated with our operating system so that they know that if they want to come on board, they've, they've got to be prepared to play the game the way we play it. And that does tend to set expectations from the start. Um, I don't know how we would have 
gotten through without EOS at this point. It's made a material difference in um, accountability and performance. It was worth, great. It was worth the discomfort. The biggest complaint I always get is, how can I get my rocks done when I've got so much else to do? And then we go back to scratch and we describe that rocks are just the priorities of what you have to do. And it's not extra work, it's focusing your work. But that's the, that's the biggest recurring issue we have. Well, what it does is it forces that dialogue of trade-offs, right? So what's important to get done? What do we need to focus around? And, and it aligns everybody in that mission or direction. I saw that Ira raised his hand. Ira, you have a thought or comment on this? Um, so prior to becoming a Vistage chair, I was a Vistage member. And one of my goals as my career started to be at 40 some odd years was how do I make myself obsolete? And um, EOS is the solution to that. Um, what I'd like to add, though, is the number one thing that I think EOS creates is the foundation of trust. And with the foundation of trust, all the other things become possible. The team being open and honest with each other. And, and it's a process. It probably took, I'm going to guess, uh, two or three years into being EOS team that the results started to really shine and went exponentially. Um, and it's all a function of building that trust of having people on different levels reporting to different people, being open, honest, and calling each other out, coming from what's the best thing for the company. And I think that's what EOS really brings. And then the rest follows of organizational structure and everybody rowing in the same direction. So I just wanted to add that. So Ira kind of articulated what, what Patrick Lencioni described in that iconic book in the Vistage community called The Five Dysfunctions of the Team. By the way, was anybody on the, on the Vistage call on Tuesday where he did a webinar? Yeah. So, 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 so Ira's articulating that. You know, in the beginning of the book, if you recall, one of the key problems of why the team and company was failing in his parable was that there wasn't any role clarification. People didn't really understand as the key members of the management team what they were being held accountable to, what their deliverables are. And the minute they started to put that in place, it started to change the effectiveness of the organization. Now jump ahead to the very end of the book. Remember, Lencioni described what I'll call the nirvana of performance management. And Ira, you alluded to this, where the entire team understands what each other is being held accountable to and they begin to self-manage each other versus having to go through the bottleneck of the CEO to get things done. Because everybody knows what they have to deliver and what their peers have to deliver. And so they begin to work, like you said, calling each other out and working together to get those things done. I'll give you one other reference point. A couple of years ago, Patrick Lencioni wrote another book. The title of the book that he launched, and many, I don't know if anybody has this, was called, um, I don't know if you can see this, it was called The Three Elements of a Miserable Job. He immediately took it off the market and retitled it. I don't know, maybe somebody gave him advice that it wasn't a great title. He didn't change any of the content. You can now find it on Amazon under, I think it's called The Three Elements or The Three Conditions of Employee Engagement. In the parables that he paints in that book, one third of the issue of why people think their job is miserable is because they don't understand what's expected of them. And this is at the frontline level. You know, Mark was alluding to it a moment ago about at the executive and management level, but even your frontline workers, they're sitting at home going, what does my boss want? What should I be doing? What is great success in doing this look like versus average or mediocre? So again, it becomes a central thing that we should be working towards. I'm going to recommend that because we have a little bit of spare time, perhaps, as things slow down over the next 90 days to six months, this might be an outstanding project to work on versus in the rising tide of economic expansion, we don't have any of the time to do this. You know, over the last six to eight years, I've asked many Vistage members, why don't you do this? You know, even though it, 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 it's the most basic thing of, of human performance motivation, and the most common answer I heard is we don't have time. Each job takes an hour and a half to two hours to really think through and define. 
At a frontline level, once you do that, it's locked in place for three to four years. At a managerial level, it's dynamic and changes every three to six months. Most people have said to me, I just don't have time to do that. So now might be an opportunity. Mark, did I see somebody just post something in the chat box? That was me. I posted the book, The Truth About Employee Engagement. I'll link the Truth that. About Employee Engagement. That's what it's called. That's great. Okay. What's the risk of not doing this? Of not going through the process of defining what success looks like, setting the outcomes and deliverables, cascading them up. The risk is missing the target, not getting to where you want to be. And, and the, 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 the phrase that I would probably share with you is a tagline from, I don't know, 30 years ago. Now, now you got to have a little gray or missing here to remember this one. Does anyone remember the advertising tagline, which was one of the greatest advertising campaigns ever, for Fram oil filters? What was that tagline? The tagline was, this is where you had to change your oil filter every, I don't know, 3,000 miles or your car would seize up and stop working. The tagline was, you can either pay me now or pay me later. You can either define what success looks like at the very beginning and get that in place, or you can attempt to manage why things aren't getting done with a big stick. And, and it's impossible, as you know, to do that with fear. So a better approach is to define success. And like Ira said, I keep coming back to it, is this idea of building trust through accountability. We have a couple of different methods of defining success. The first method we call soaring. Nice visual reference point of soaring up here with the eagles, floundering down here with the turkeys. I love this process, probably because I invented it, but I love this process because it links what people have to do, what you're holding them accountable to doing, back to what you're trying to achieve as an organization. Every managerial role, this would be the process by which you would define success. It's very similar to SMART objectives. You know, what are we trying to get done? What are the obstacles in getting there? What are the action steps to overcome those obstacles? And then what's the yardstick measurement tool, uh, a vehicle we're using to measure that and define what success looks like? And for most of my clients, this takes an hour and a half to two hours to work through for each individual job. Every job has three to six of these. Three to six outcomes, deliverables, expectations that I'd say in less than 1% of the job descriptions I've ever looked at, articulate these. So if you were going to change your process, I would not recommend you throw your job descriptions out. That'd be pretty hard after 50 years of using job descriptions. But what many of my clients have done is they built a little box at the bottom of the job description and they put these success deliverables or factors in, or they attach an addendum to the traditional job description that represents what the outcomes, metrics, deliverables are in the role. So there's a number of different ways to do this on a hybrid approach versus you know, throwing the entire system you got for defining work out the window. This takes care of about 10% of your workforce, the folks that are in managerial roles and leading teams. But 90% of your workforce, you don't hold them accountable to business outcomes and results. You don't measure how they're helping move the business forward. How do we determine if our frontline workers, the field techs, the administrative assistants, the forklift drivers, the, the clerk on the loading dock, how do we determine that they're doing a great job in what they do day to day? What's the tool we use to measure that? This, by the way, is not a trick question. If we're not measuring outcomes, deliverables, and company objectives in our lower level frontline workers, what are we using to measure whether they're being successful in what they're doing? You guys are thinking too hard. KPIs, performance indicators, right? Quality standards, efficiency outcomes, productivity outcomes. The goal, like Patrick Lencioni talked about, would be to cascade down through the entire organization what the expectations are for every role. Every one of your employees, like Fiona was talking about, should be able to rattle off the tip of their tongue, here's what I'm held accountable to delivering, and here's how it's measured. And this is the difference between what success in it looks like versus average or mediocre. Whether it's around a behavior, 
or it's around an actual like productivity measurement. This doesn't happen overnight. It takes about 18 to 24 months to fully embed this into the fabric of your organization. And, and the biggest problem is not coming up with what the measurement stick is. The biggest problem is, is the change management of getting people to accept being held accountable. And that's a, that's a coaching process and there's lots of experts that can help you through that. And that's what I think is at the heart and core of that, that whole EOS model. Before we move on, any comments or thoughts about cascading this down, defining expectations, and communicating that to folks? Which I think is amplified in this arena where people are working remotely. They wanna know, what do you expect me to do? Should I work for one hour a day and sit in front of the TV for the other six? Instead of measuring how much time I'm in front of my computer, we should be measuring how good a job am I doing and what needs to get done. The problem is that requires a lot of management focus in defining it. Any thoughts or comments? Okay, something to think about when we cycle back to the very end on our rapid recall. Just briefly, I mentioned this as we were cycling around on our agenda. Are we giving people the coaching, the support they need in understanding how to run effective online meetings, whether those are formal team meetings, interdisciplinary team meetings uh, with customers? Do they have the right skills, the right knowledge? Do they know how to engage folks in a conversation? Can they ask the right questions? Are they being aware of the introverts that are getting run over by the extroverts and making sure everybody feels good about their ability to participate? As I said earlier, one of the most important elements of employee motivation, satisfaction, engagement is the direct relationship a manager has with their subordinate. One of the most effective tools to uh, uh, create a vehicle for that is a one-to-one. -one. Okay, now I'm gonna assume that because you're on this call with Mark, none of you would admit to Mark to his face that you're not doing one-to-ones. So our assumption is everybody's doing one-to-ones with their direct reports. My question is, are you cascading that down through your organization? Are all of your managers and supervisors doing a great job of this with their teams? Do they have the knowledge of how to do it? My recommendation is to take your one page success factor snapshot or whatever you're gonna call it, that lists the six to eight core outcomes, objectives, KPIs, behavioral expectations, Lay that on the virtual table between you and your subordinate, and that drives the conversation. But we should get to that probably after the first five to 10 minutes of building rapport, showing caring, showing empathy. I'm going to talk about this, this caring and empathy piece in, the, in a few minutes and, and how to engage folks in these conversations. But are you teaching your managers how to show they care about their employees when they're doing one-to-ones? What's, you know, one of the great things about um, entrepreneurial organizations is that sometimes the most successful people um, who are able to drive things forward fit on the DISC profile, the high D category. They're driven, they're aggressive, they're assertive, they're type A, they run over people, they don't care about them personally, the task is the most important thing. And, and sometimes with those folks, we need to do a little bit of coaching to help them understand how to be a little more caring and empathetic, gracious, kind, especially during this time period where people are just obsessed with fear and problems with their family and their extended family. This is not natural for most people. So my question is, have any of you started doing any kind of coaching of your management team to help them be more effective in this versus just assuming because they carry some kind of managerial title, they should be able to do it. Are we pointing them to TED Talk, you know, conversations on being gracious? Are we putting some kind of structure in place to demonstrate it? Are we doing any kind of one-to-one -one coaching that builds this as one of the core elements or values in your organization? And anybody by show of hands doing anything specifically above and beyond what you were doing before we went remote? No? So, so something to work on, and I'll come back and reemphasize that point when I get to the caring and um, uh, empathy piece in a few minutes. Um, anybody, here's another question. 
anybody uh, working on teaching your managers, your direct reports, how to do good one-to-ones with their teams. You know, I understand the Vistage model that Mark is doing this with you and you might be doing it with your direct reports, but are we literally moving this down through the entire organization? Silence, okay, so again, that's, a, that's an opportunity to be working on through this uh, time period. There is no better managerial tool I have ever seen in 20 years than doing a direct one-to-one -one with a subordinate. Now, before the recession, before this time period, I'm assuming you're probably, you've been doing these probably maybe once a month. I'm going to recommend you might want to consider moving this to once a week. Your team desperately craves this one-on-one -on -one time with you. And if you have a lot of change and a lot of different things going on, you might even want to consider accelerating it to, to a more frequent time period. Again, the nice thing about one-to-ones as a management tool is you can flex it depending on the level of change going on in your organization. We talked about this idea of engaging employees. If you want to get tremendous engagement, satisfaction, happiness, commitment from folks, one of the things we have to do is move them out of this disengaged category into the engaged category. And all the studies of human resources, human capital, from anybody that's published on this stuff in the last 15 years, all ties back to that original Gallup research. 50 to 70% of your workforce is in the two categories around disengagement. And to me, the great news is it's very simple to move folks up and out of that. There are five key things I'm gonna share with you. Gallup actually identified 12. Like Mark mentioned, you know, I have a best friend at work. I have the right tools to do my job. I'm going to throw out five things that I think you could be working on over the next three to six months that could make a dramatic difference in how people are engaged and motivated. Number one, are we thanking people? Are we showing appreciation? Are we recognizing folks? And in most companies I find or organizations, this is a totally random, scattered um, non-structured approach where we just kind of leave it up to each individual manager to do whatever they want. And if I had one recommendation out of this point, it will be to put structure in place around recognition and praise. So some of my clients, and then I'm going to ask the question of what you all are doing, some of my clients are actually, uh, when they do their uh, weekly team meetings, are calling out someone on the, in the team meeting who did something great and patting them on the back in front of their peers. The CEO, when you're doing your every other week, hand, all hands on video chat with the entire company or organization, are you calling out a few people of something they did that was extraordinary? Now, now we're not talking about the, you know, the American youth soccer organization where everybody gets a trophy for showing up. I'm talking about when people knock it out of the park, do something great, hit a high expectation, demonstrate one of the core values that's important to your organization that exemplifies how you want everybody else to treat customers or peers. How are we recognizing that? How are we communicating it? What's the structure for it? Some of my clients have printed up thank you cards and then they've taught their managers, here's the things that are recognizable as praiseworthy events. Here's the words and phrases you can use to actually praise and pat people on the back. And here's the different vehicles you might use to do it. A personal pat on the back in private, a group call out in a session, or a personal note that you might write to send home that they're gonna pin on the refrigerator, they're so proud of it. Why is this important? Because study after study has shown that even for the most motivated employees, you're the ones who run through brick walls for you, your Pareto group, when you don't pat them on the back, you don't praise them for going above and beyond the call of duty, they stop doing it because they don't think you care. They don't think it's important. And why should they bang their head on the wall if it's not important to you? So that's why I think this is such a, and, and again, all the studies back this up, saying thank you, showing appreciation, being gracious is one of the most important elements of building a highly motivated workforce. The key is, to make it structured in how you do it, not leaving it random. 
Let me throw it out to the group. Is anybody doing any specific structured program process approach for saying thank you and recognizing people? Mark, anybody putting their hand up here? You're muted, Mark. Joe. Sure. Yeah, so one of the questions that we ask when an employee first comes onto our team is how do they like to be recognized and how do they like to receive feedback? Um, in our industry, we're a very much in-person industry. We're in physical therapy and us going to uh, remote working is, is a huge change. So one of the things that we really focused on once this transition started happening was revisiting all of that to see how people like to be recognized or receive feedback. Um, and we've added it to our daily checklist for all managers um, to make sure that they're giving out recognition as well as truthful, specific, positive feedback. So, so my question, uh, is it Joe or Joseph? Joe. Joe, H have you trained your managers in this as to just assuming because you've got a manager title, you should be good at giving, you know, recognition and saying thank you and being appreciative? No, we've trained. We've actually made it a part of our culture for not just managers, but our, all of our employees to be able to provide uh, truthful, specific, and positive feedback. We call it TSP. That's great. One of the ways my client, some of my clients during this time period have improved upon this is to create peer-to-peer -peer recognition. So, you know, to create a committee or a group where they're soliciting feedback as opposed to from the managers or the executive team, they're soliciting it from peers and then having some kind of reward program around it. Anyone else? Something structured? Okay, a good book I would recommend to you is a book written by a guy by the name of Bob Nelson. It's probably $9.95 download on Amazon. And the book is titled A Thousand Among Ways to Energize Your Employees. And he takes eight or nine different categories like praise, recognition, achievement awards, fun, learning and development, and a variety of other subject areas and he has hundreds of ideas that companies have submitted in little tiny paragraph form from GE to 15 person size organizations, what they do to reinforce some of these things. There may be one or two ideas that you take away from this and adapt to your organization, but it's probably been the best centralized repository or location of just a, a huge number of ideas of different things and processes you could use. One of the things that I like best that I find is a best practice in this is this should not be a management down approach. Form a committee of your frontline workers, give them a little budget and let them come up with what their peers and other folks in the organization would most like, like Joe was just talking about, to be recognized and patted on the back for. That's probably one of the best ways I've seen companies do this. Uh, somebody just post something in the chat, Mark? That was me. I'm posting the links to these books. His newest oh. one is 1,501 ways to reward employees. Right. He updated it. It was originally called 1,001, and then he updated it. It's a great book. I constantly am referring to it and making suggestions to my clients. Number two, now we come back to this idea of caring and empathy. Most managers aren't wired this way. They don't know what questions to ask. They don't know how to solicit this and be and, and show this level of empathy and trust with folks. And so one of the things I teach in my, my engagement and retention program is a technique called conducting a learning impact and becoming conversation. The technical term in human resources for this is a stay interview. This is where you might say to your employee, why do you like being part of our organization? What holds you here? You know, before we hit this little recessionary time, you may have had two or three job offers from other companies. Why have you stayed in our organization? What's the vision you have of what you think you can accomplish here? What are the notches in your belt you think you need to clip in terms of learning projects, uh, accomplishments to get to that? What's standing in your way? How can I help you? How am I either being a roadblock or helping to facilitate that? Now, why do you think most CEOs, key executives, managers would be reticent, wait, reticent's probably the wrong word, scared to death of having this conversation with their direct reports? 
Why would you not want to engage in this kind of a dialogue with your direct reports? What's the biggest fear factor you would have that might come out of this? What's the worst case scenario? Ira? Well, both to make a joke and to be very serious, the biggest fear I'm aware of is her hand on his shoulder. <laughs> and I'm serious. I'm making a joke, but I'm serious. I, I know I've changed my style dramatically. I'm a kissy, huggy kind of guy. And I now almost, um, not quite six feet of distance from my people, but close. And I, I are you suggesting I might use a different graphic to convey this point? Yeah. <laughs> suggestion <laughs> um, the number one fear factor is that if I engage with you around this dialogue you realize I can't do what you need done for you or our company can't you'll leave now now I don't like to use absolute so I'll say that I won't say that never happens but I'd say it rarely ever happens and in fact when you finish this dialogue with your employees what they'll usually, what you usually do is you go out of the room, you'll slap yourself in the forehead and laugh hysterically because they didn't ask you for anything. They just wanted the opportunity for you to listen, for them to articulate it. You're the most important thing to them in the entire company. The study after study has shown it's about the manager. And so my key point is, are we teaching our managers, like Ira, you mentioned this idea of trust. Are we teaching them how to convey caring, empathy, graciousness, kindness. We're making it personal. Maybe we don't have to put our hand on their shoulder, but, but are we getting personal and intimate with them around these kinds of difficult, painful conversations? This is how you build trust. And that trust issue is probably 90% of the relationship issue. But it's something that's not natural. We have to actually teach it. You know, Mark, he's been trained in how to do this. He's an expert at it of how to have these kinds of conversations. Susan Scott, who wrote the iconic book in the Vistage community, Fierce Conversations of what a chair does in a one-to-one. -one. Um, there, there, there are some other good resources around this. But the key is, are we having lunch and learns? Are we teaching our managers? Are you coaching this methodology, this technique of caring and empathy by role modeling it to your direct reports so that they can begin to demonstrate it to theirs? Number three, are we helping people to understand how they matter? This was another third of Patrick Lencioni's book around, you know, people feeling like they have a miserable job is they didn't understand what the purpose of the organization was, how they mattered in that helping the team, the organization and their clients be successful, be happy, uh, get a great joy from that product or service. To many employees, they feel like they're just another number in the payroll system. We don't articulate it. We don't have the conversation with them. We don't physically demonstrate to them how much they matter to what we do and how important that is to our clients. And this is a prime element of employee motivation and happiness. It is at the highest level what Maslow talked about in uh, the, the uh, uh, back in the, I don't know, when was it, the 40s and 50s that he wrote, the, the hierarchy of needs. This is at the very top of that pyramid, the point of the apex of that, that uh, 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 capstone. Do you matter? And as I said, in, in Patrick Lencioni's book, he spends a third of the book talking about this issue of matterness. Number four, everybody wants to learn. Everybody wants to get better. They want to become more effective. More effective. Now, the problem in most entrepreneurial organizations is that we spend very little time and effort around learning, development, growing people. Very little time. And especially what I've noticed over the last six to eight years is that just has gone completely out the window. We're too busy trying to get things done, so we don't have time to develop you. I think now is a perfect time to show how much you care about people by setting a personal development plan for every single member of your organization, right down to the lowest level of two to three, not 27 things, two to three core things that they can do to build the gap in skill and knowledge between who they are today and where you need them to get to. Now, what do you gotta do first? 
You have to teach your managers how to do this skill assessment, this knowledge assessment. Here's where Joe is today. In six months to a year, I need Joe to be able to do X. There's a gap. It's not a good or bad thing. It's just there's a gap between what he's capable of doing today and where I need him to be. What is that gap? In skill, learning, knowledge, the kinds of projects he needs to work on so he can deliver these results I need from him in 12 months. Help people get to that stage versus reaching that stage and realizing we didn't do anything to help them uh, achieve that point. Learning and development is one of the most important elements of employee engagement and satisfaction. And then the last one is around teams. Most people I talk to are incredibly frustrated by the teams they work on. They don't really understand what's the purpose of the team, what's the outcome the team is trying to get to, it's not articulated or written down. What's the decision-making the team has the authority for versus what has to get kicked up to a higher level? What's the process by which we're going to work? And what's the role or expectation for every one of the team members? Most people find teams to be a complete waste of time. The manager's not effective at delegating. There's a lack of feedback and follow-through. And people are confused over where we're going or what we're trying to do. One way to dramatically boost your employee satisfaction, happiness, and engagement is to be a little more intentional around how teams are working and be able to articulate that. Communication. If I had one word I could sum up this whole process with that everybody's raising their arms about, it's over communicate. Boost it by 10 to 20 times whatever you used to do. Many of my clients have started having coffee breaks in the morning with, with all of their teams for casual conversation. They follow this up with stand-up meetings, maybe 15 minutes, check-ins at the end of the day of how we did and how we progressed and what we need to think about for tomorrow. They're doing all hands-on meetings where the CEO is frequently communicating what's going on, what's changed, what's new, what's the strategy, how are we getting there. Team meetings should be held on a regular basis. One-to-one -one should be well laid out and structured in advance. And then finally, we should be building a little bit of fun into this. How often are we going to do, um, you know, casual Friday after work happy hours? Are we going to use do a pizza party on uh, Wednesday afternoons? We're no longer celebrating everyone's birthday in the office. Maybe once a week, we'll take whoever had a birthday this week, and we'll all sing happy birthday to that person. Are we building time in for games together? Are we doing team building? Is there a show your pet to the video camera? Um, the, the chat tools of Yammer, uh, what, uh, what was the other one? Uh, Slack uh, provide some of this. But how are we communicating and what's the formal structure for that? My recommendation is to lay out a communication plan. How often, what are we doing, when are we doing it? And share it with your entire team. Don't let people guess of, is this evolving daily? What's it gonna look like tomorrow? Lay out the plan. Yes, it may enhance. Yes, you may develop it further and refine it as we go forward, but at least tell them what's the expectation for how we're gonna start communicating with each other. Last two items. Do you have a strategy or plan in place of where you're going, how you're gonna get there, what you're gonna do next, what contingency plan A is? You know, if we're under stay at home, shelter in place through the end of May, that's one thing. What if it's at the end of August? How will that change? What, what's happening with, you know, our local community, our national community, internationally? How is that affecting our plans? Your workforce desperately is looking to you as the leaders for what the plan is. Yes, it may change. Next week, it, it may get refined, but they want to know that you're in control of it and you've, you've got the path forward and you're positive about it and you will emerge from this. And they wanna know what that looks like and what their role is in it's going to be. My recommendation would be, if you don't have the plan in place and you haven't deeply communicated it through your managers and to your entire workforce, now in the next few days would be the time to put that in place and share it with people. Again, when you don't share it, folks make it up and they make up the worst case scenarios. And this leads us to our very last element, which is, are there two or three things that you've put on the back burner during this economic expansion that you just haven't gotten to? Like 
putting EOS in place, defining success, improving processes, increasing customer engagement, uh, using a tool to communicate deeper, penetrating customers, uh, uh, you know, at a deeper level, getting a greater share, things that we haven't done because we haven't had the time that over the next 90 days to six months might allow us to become even more effective, emerge stronger from this, and maybe even have a competitive advantage we didn't have before we entered into this. So, Mark, what I'd like to do is take our last couple of minutes together and, and maybe go one by one around the virtual table, and I'll let you to you manage this, of out of this, this hour or so that we've spent together, is there one low-hanging piece of fruit? This is the rapid recall. One low-hanging piece of fruit that you heard that you're, you're not doing, you're not working on, that, that you can take back and immediately start to put in place to either improve productivity, efficiency, flawless execution, employee engagement, retention, or how you're communicating with folks. So Mark, I'm, I'm gonna turn it back over to you and let you take us through the uh, folks that are on the call. Okay, I'm gonna unmute you, Fiona, and BJ, you'll be next. Um, wow, there's a, a lot of good stuff to take out of this, Barry, but um, I think the one that uh, resonates most with me is coaching my um, direct reports on how they should be cascading down messaging during this period, especially um, in ramping up the amount of communication um, and having focused one-on-ones. Thank you, Fiona. <laughs> Thanks, Barry. I uh, learned a lot this uh, past hour, but to think the over-communication is one of the things that I'm going to be more, more I've been trying, but I think I'm still lagging a little bit and probably uh, praising and uh, shouting out success to uh, other, uh, you know, coworkers that have, uh, you know, done stuff that, uh, you know, nobody thought could be done in these times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think one of the most important elements of this whole recognition and praise piece is not so much the one-to-one -one praise, but it's, it's taking those examples where people exemplify what you want done or how you want them to work and sharing it with everyone else. You know, so you, if you don't have a natural mechanism for doing this, how, how can you do this when we're all offline? Maybe it's something, just sharing something in the collaboration tools. Maybe it's when you're doing your, your broadcast to the entire team, you call out a couple of people for things that they've done. The key is to put some structure around it. Yes. Hey, I got another quick question for you. What about on the flip side of the praise if you know, uh, we just can't get an employee to engage? Um, you know, what, I don't want to say consequences, or what do you think we should be uh, you know, trying to get them to do better. Is it just, How do you reprimand uh, virtually? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I, I lost the buzzer, so I can't tase them in the office. So, so is this an extension of non-performance or toxic behavior that just carries over from before we were virtual to now? Or is it a problem that just suddenly rose up because now they're virtual and not working in the office? I think it's uh, exacerbated just because, you know, he went home. Uh, I'm seeing one employee right now that, you know, I offered him, hey, take your docking station home, take some monitors home. So you're really, you know, could be, you know, use two monitors and try to utilize as much as we can, you know, to have all different applications open. And he's just sitting, you know, every time we video chat, he's sitting on his couch, on his lap, just on the laptop. And I don't know, that would drive me nuts to be produ 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 uh, productive that way. But, you know, I've, I've offered him everything I can to be more productive and he just keeps, you know, pushing the back. So, so my question would be is, if you set the metrics, the outcomes, the deliverables of what you want this person to do, are they missing those? They're not being as productive as you need them to be, or is it that you're just frustrated they're not working like you would expect them to work? Probably the like second. Like sitting on the couch. Yeah. <laughs> well, you sit on the couch with the TV on, and the other, you know, yeah, I guess it's probably the second half of that, but there's still not enough activity coming out of, uh, you know, what he should be doing. So the question then would be, have you commu communicated it clearly? Have you both reached an agreement on that's what needs to be done? Or is there some discussion around that they don't buy into that or they don't agree with it? And once they agree with it, have you two agreed on what is going to be the measurement stick? You know, are we going to check in with each other at the end of every day and review these seven things? So I think, again, it's just putting more rigor around it. Yeah. It hasn't got to that point yet, but it is getting to where I need to start, you know, doing that. But, you know, I don't want to sit there and count how many phone calls he's made during the day. You know what I mean? It's not... I don't want to do that if I don't have to. So, so this is a great point. 
you're not you're not focused on how much time you're working or what are the metrics of you sitting in front of your computer how often did you pick up the phone convert that into what's the result you want by them making those phone calls okay. is it a sales issue is it a customer engagement issue is it a you know a customer service response rate what's the thing you're trying to measure and making sure they clearly understand it and then they also need to understand what the consequences are, this is Mark's point, of what is going to happen if they don't do it. I don't mean for this to be a stick or to, to coach people through fear, but they need to understand both what the positive recognition reward piece is, but also what the consequence side is. Yeah. Otherwise, they just flake off. And, and again, one of the most important things that's happening, I think, in this remote working environment is that most folks don't clearly understand what you want for them. So, so they're having trouble figuring out how should I work and how much should I work and what kind of effort should I put in? Yeah, gotcha, thank you, that helps. All right, I'm gonna to go to Jay and then I'm gonna to go to Joe. Okay. So I think, uh, for me, interesting, I think on the strategy side of it, I think our whole strategy for the last three to four weeks is uh, as a large organization, trying to figure out how everybody can work remotely and our infrastructure has held up pretty nicely um but i feel like we haven't done any other strategy so it kind of ties into the last thing the, the path forward on on some of the strategic things that we have been working on i feel like everything has been uh put on hold so i think you know planning the path forward uh, maybe even thinking about when you get back to the office and two you know, doing more than just making sure uh, you're able to function remotely uh, and, and get, uh, you know, hit your client service level agreements. Uh, the organization's always been more than that. And I think we, we need to, now that everything's settled down as much as it can, you know, get back to that, the, the last two things that you were uh, discussing. That's why I think there's a great time to think about these things. You know, the first week or two was just the crisis of the, the shock to our system of going remote. Then the third week was how to get some of the government money out of the Small Business Administration and all of those problems and issues. Now we're getting into a, a, a mode of how do we start to transition from crisis kind of operation to thinking forward, visionary, being positive and conveying that message to everyone. So really good point, Jay. Yeah, yesterday in Patrick Lynn and Sony's presentation, he said, uh, when market conditions change, your strategy needs to change. Right, 100%. Yes. All right, thank you, Jay. Uh, Joe, you're next. Yeah, so mine's twofold. Uh, you know, since the crisis, most of my one-to-ones have been very tactical, and I need to get back to that regular developmental coaching meeting with each one of my team members. So definitely committing to that. The other thing is that our organization, we always run very lean. Um, you know, band, bandwidth is always something that you hear uh, during our old normal. And um, now with our newfound time on our hands, what are some, some key objectives that we could be putting into place right now um, or some projects that we could be working on now so when we come out, uh, we're stronger? Exactly. And, and I, uh, I'm going to tie this back to the comment that Fiona made earlier, which is now people look at you and go, well, I'm already doing all these things. Now you want me to work on these things. What's the biggest priority? And what I love about that EOS and the performance-based model is it forces the dialogue of what's important. Should I let this go? Should I not work as hard on this? Is this more important to you? When is it expected? Because I can't cram 10 pounds into a five pound bag, but the, it just, it forces and facilitates that kind of conversation and dialogue to align the organization. Thanks, Thank Joe. You, Joe. Ira. Here we go. Um, oh, it's real simple for me. Um, it's called as soon as the recording comes out, my entire Vistage team will be listening to it because they'll hear it better from you than from me. Great. And I bet if you contacted Barry directly, he might even do a special meeting for your entire Vistage group. We've got them scheduled for August. Oh. <laughs> Great. But, but I'm, what's interesting is I'm, doing, I'm starting to do these now for company groups, not just for Vistage groups, because the companies want, like you said, they want to get their management teams involved in it. 
Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it's just great. I, I've been talking to my group about EOS. So like I said, let them hear it from you. It'll just be more powerful. Ira, I'm hoping that by August, I'm Me getting back onto a plane. Me um, too. God willing, right? Absolutely. From your mouth to God's ears. There you go. Who's next? So, uh, Dr. Farah, are you still with us? Hello? Hello. Hi there. Hi. Uh, so, I'm uh, just listening to everyone's advice and... Um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I feel like I'm still in a little bit of panic mode. Um, I'm trying to figure out what to do with the doctors I've employed that have nothing to really do right now. And, you know, getting ahead, we're trying to build up our patient education and our blogs, but I don't know how long that can go on for before the company starts bleeding out money. So I am prepared for doing a little bit of proactive work. Um, but, you know, at the, at the same time, it's, it's how long you know, how long does that make sense for until, until you have to, you know, make the, the changes that nobody really wants to make. So in, in terms of position, that's where I'm at. And if anyone has any, any other advice uh, for me, I'm we're a podiatry office in Manhattan and, and, you know, there's obviously no patients and telemedicine is, is very, very little when, you know, people aren't really getting injured. So they're not going anywhere. <laughs> Barry? I, I, I was going to, I mean, she, she asked the question of the whole group. I, I thought I'd let the group maybe respond to this or have a comment, and then I have a couple of ideas and thoughts I'd throw out. Does anybody want to share something? What can you do when you're, you're suddenly the business isn't there for your team? You can't sustain it too long a term. What can they be doing and focused on versus just sitting at home waiting for the phone to ring? Well, I've been suggesting to my members that they use this time to increase their learning and their skills, you know, using programs like lynda.com, which is owned by LinkedIn, which is owned by Microsoft to, you know, improve their Excel or their PowerPoint, or even they have some leadership skills or assign TED Talks or work on their processes, their standard operating procedures and write those, the things that... Uh, we never have the time to do during normal circumstances. This might be the time to do that. Referral mechanisms. Eventually, your business is going to come back. People are going to come into a doctor's office about issues and problems that might not be overtly urgent um, or essential, as they call it now. Um, and what are the ways of putting those, those mechanisms in place of driving patients, driving referrals, building loyalty that you could be doing right now? For example, as I said earlier in our call, some of my clients are putting uh, uh, right now Slack in place so they can communicate intimately with their clients, even though their clients aren't ordering new things, purchasing is completely stopped, the supply chains have crashed, but they're building relationships, talking to their clients and improving communication in spite of all of that. That, that may, may or not be appropriate in your case, but usually for every business I've looked at, there are things that you could be doing so that you emerge even stronger and more capable in six months than you are today. So Barry, I, I wanna thank you for generously taking your time to present this subject matter expertise to our Vistage community here in New York. I uh, wanna thank each of you for engaging. I will uh, post a copy of this recording um, for all of you. And Barry's going to send me some additional goodies that I will uh, send to you as well. Do you have any final words, Barry? I just want to wish all of you much success. N notice I didn't say luck. I want to wish you much success over the next three to six months so that you emerge from this, 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 this crisis, this, this reset, this setback, that you emerge even stronger than you are today. Thank you all very much for your time today. Thank you, Barry. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.